on? How are we doing? <laughs> and we can do better than this. How are we doing? <laughs> Fantastic. People have had some coffee. Great. Hi, so my name's Richard. And I'm Dov Ra Raul. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and we're going to be talking about Java Collections, The Force Awakens. Uh, and so what's a collection role? All right, I think the sound is all right. We don't need it anymore. <laughs> so, um, you know, collections, very basic data structure to store a bunch of objects together. <laughs> it's a little bit like, um, like the stormtroopers. You know, we want to store them in a spaceship, but the spaceships need to have different characteristics. Maybe in terms of storage, in terms of speed, it's exactly the same thing with collections. And what we're going to do in this talk is to discuss different topics related to what we do with collections on day to day and how we can improve them. So we're going to start off by having a look at how some API changes reduce the scope for some bugs with collections. Then we're going to have a look at some of the features that have been introduced in uh, Java episodes 8 and 9 um, and how uh, we can use those features a little bit. And then we'll talk about some more kind of interesting data structure things. So perhaps looking a little bit more long term, a little bit more big picture that, that for things we get with collections. We'll talk about persistent and immutable collections. And then also talk a little bit about hash map implementations and how you can make use of third-party libraries and what performance trade-offs and benefits you get there. So let's get started with collection problems. And this poor machine here was hit by an array out of bound exception. That's what happens. That's, what happens. That's how it fell on its face. That's the classic first kind of bug that you often see with collections. Then what we're going to talk about is concurrent modification checked and acts. Maybe two bugs that are not so... Um, so come on. So what we've got going on here is uh, obviously we've got an army of Jedi's, you know, and we want to make sure that we're selecting Jedi's that have a um, counter letter. So any Jedi's with lowercase letter. They're, they're not very good. They suck, basically. So just run this code, see what happens. What we get is Boom. a WTL concurrent modification exception. So what happens behind the scene is that this for loop here is spinning up an iterator object. This iterator object is responsible for handling the collection. And if it detects that something else is trying to modify the source, then it fails fast and we throw an exception as a way to catch bugs. So, so that kind of sucks, but how do we fix that role? We, we want to modify the collection in the middle of that loop. What, what would we do? So what we can do is to make use of a um, vintage Java head. Lovely. A old school iterator object for Jedi's, and here the next is going to be a Jedi. Fantastic. So now, if the Jedi here actually um, starts with a lowercase letter, only in that case we can remove it from the source by using the iterator which is managing um, the source. So let's just run this code and see what we've got. Fantastic. We're left with Luke Skywalker ready to go. So that works, but it feels like we have to throw away a lot of advances, a lot of niceties, like a full reach loop here, and go back to this very, as you say, very vintage style, uh, you know, Java. I, I don't want to listen to music on vinyl. I'm, I, I want to I wanna a bit more advanced API than that. So what, what can you do for me here? So who's a, who uses Java 8 at work? Fantastic. So that's a great example here of a uh, idiom that is quite verbose and error prone. And there is um, an update to the API, which introduced a method called remove f that takes a predicate as an argument and is going to do a mutable change to that collection. So in this case, what we want to do is to check that this Jedi here uh, starts with a um, lowercase letter. We can run this code, and it works as well. OK? So much simpler, an API here to make use of a common ether. Excellent. Much simpler. So you're also talking about this check then act thing. I saw that on the slide, Raoul. So what's, what's the check then act type problems? So we're going to move a little bit from the army of Jedi's here and talk about movies. Has anyone watched The Phantom Menace? Very yeah. few people willing to put their hands up or admit that at this moment in time. Go on, you all have, sadly. Well, we're going to pretend that we're going to be watching this movie a few times, you know, a hundred thousand times. That's great. So we've got a piece of code here, you know, that stores essentially 
a string representation of the movie and the number of views for that movie. And we're going to iterate one by one, increment the views by uh, incrementing this, this, this map. Let's so just run this code, see what we've got going on. Right, we've got 100,000 views. We run it again, everything works. Okay. Nice and deterministic, or at least according to this one print line. But let's say, you know, we need to scale, Richard. You know, we need to be web scale. Scale. Lovely. So let's add a little bit of um, concurrency. So let's say we're going to set up a, a, a thread pool, which we're going to submit jobs to. So what does the concurrent add method do here? So the concurrent add method here is going to, again, loop until the number of views is reached and send jobs to that thread pool to increment this So we've got different threads, each trying to increment the value on these, these movie values. So let's start off with one single thread in a pool. OK, lovely. Fantastic. We have 100,000. Ship it. It works. Seems to be working. So let's expand that thread pool a little bit. So let's use, let's use two. Ooh. Let's see what happens. Hmm. So that's, 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 that's a ra you've got a random number generator. Great random number generator. It's not, it's not a very good random number generator, is it, though? Because it's, it's slightly random, but not very random. <laughs> Seems like it's always above 90,000. Lovely. So what is possibly happening here? Well, you know, Richard, we're doing some concurrency here. I have about this thing called a concurrent hash map that must solve the problem. Yeah, definitely. Do that. Do that. Let's use a concurrent hash map. Perfect. Let's try again. It's Even a lower number. Work. Oh, it's over 90,000 again. Lovely. So let's, um, let's take a look a little bit at this method here, concurrent add, and see a little bit what's going on. So we're submitting a job, add one view. Let's go to this add one view method here. What that's implementing is essentially <coughs> getting the number of views for the movie. So that's a get step. Checking that the views is not null. So we're checking that there is a value that is present. And in that case, we're actually updating that map. So this is referred to as a checked and act pattern. We're checking some, some property in the map, so that's not equal to null, and then we're acting based on that predicate. So what you're saying here is if you've got multiple threads, they can read the number of views beforehand, and then another thread can come in, work a little bit on the data structure, and then the second thread comes in and writes back its old, incorrectly updated value. So even though the concurrent data structure is concurrent, we've got our get and our put not being an atomic operation. So uh, I'm going to speak a bit louder while I'm being set with uh, this move. Interesting. Uh, um, <laughs> so what we're going to try and do now is to use um, the concurrent hash map API and try to use this method called replace. So replace essentially is going to try and do a bit like a compare and swap mechanism, check that there is an old value in, in the map. If yes, it swaps it with an updated value. If not, it fails and it's going to try again. So okay. let's implement that. So while so Raul needs to two. start off by using a loop here because these uh, replace operations may fail and then you'd need to retry it until it succeeds. So view is now equal to null, so that at that stage we know that, okay, there is potential value here. We're going to try and replace that, um, that value. So views is the old value. And we want to replace with an updated value, which is essentially adding uh, one to it. And if that succeeded, we can break up the loop and go on and do the next job. If that failed, we get a new value and try again until eventually we'll succeed. So let's run this code, see what we've got going on now. Fantastic. We wow. get Can you run it a few more times just to tell me it's really 100,000 every time? See, it looks like it's it does. deterministically 100,000. Lovely. <laughs> but, but Richard. Again, like, like the iterator problem, there was a way of solving this beforehand. But this is a bit ugly, isn't it? it uh, you know, you keep on having to try and do the same operation. Do I need to have a big loop every time I want to update a hash map? So this is another example of an idiom that is error-prone and verbose to use. Java 8 introduced a uh, new method called um, compute if present. That's going to take the, the key, which is the, the movie. And, um, 
a function from that key and the value currently associated with it, and it's going to return the new value, the updated value afterwards. Um, and anything that's uh, thread safe and current implementation of that map interface is going to have to provide an implementation of this that works in that manner as well. So, if we run it, it works as well. Ship so it. We ship it. So that's a great example of a compound operation, which could lead to bugs in the context of currency, but the API was updated to provide out of the box in a um, thread safe manner. Great, so that covers sort of the two common bugs that we see with collection. And the last one, the checked and act uh, bug, is actually an interesting one. So there's some research that has looked at several open source projects like Cassandra and Lucene. So, you know, some projects that are quite uh, popular. And they wrote a static analysis tool to detect those kind of bugs. And they found around 280 bugs in over 28 projects. And the majority of those bugs were similar to what we've so shown, put if absent. So if there's no value, then we will act on that and insert a new value in the map or in a queue, etc. OK? So here's a paper reference if you're interested in uh, looking Finding at this. Out more. But the, s the nice story here is that those kind of idioms, library desires can help us by updating the API for idioms that are very prone, and we've seen that in Java 8. But in certain scenarios, maybe we may use a different data structure that actually puts restrictions on how we're writing and reading to that data structure. And that's what we'll be covering in the remaining of uh, this talk. Fantastic. So Richard, episode 8 and 9. What is happening? Fantastic. A few little improvements here with Java 8 and 9 on a number of fronts. So there's quite a nice uh, uh, optimization that starts, as of Java 8, lazily initializing the backing data straws in, in several of these collections uh, classes. So array lists, for example, have a backing array behind them. And as of Java 8, that gets lazily initialized. So if you don't add anything into the array list, there's no array backing it. And the same thing with hash maps. The backing entry table in the hash map doesn't get allocated until you actually put something into it. Now, it turns out that this actually saves about 1% to 2% of memory consumption, because there are lots of times when people use empty hash maps or have empty hash maps lying around in their API. So a classic example, for example, is you might get something that's basically a hash map with, say, a series of request parameters for a, a URL, an HTTP URL. And loads of URLs just have no request parameters after them. And we'll go and allocate you a whole hash map that's entirely empty and not used. So it fits that idiom. But there was also a slightly more interesting uh, change as well, a, a renaming change. So so a quick raise of hands. Is anyone using the optional data type in Java 8 or in Google Guava, potentially? Wow. So one of the interesting things was the observation about optional.get was that it's a trap. It's a huge trap. OK? Can we all say it together, please? Three, two, one. It's a trap. Fantastic. So optional.get is being deprecated as a method and renamed to get when present. Um, and a few other useful additions are happening in the optional API. Uh, so ability to convert optionals into streams, for example, because optionals are, in many respects, a, a one-element collection. Um, and there's also a few other stream API improvements. It take while and drop while. So things that keep elements in a stream or throw them away from a stream if they match a certain predicate. And um, collection factory methods. So What's another, happening with collection factory methods? Another addition to Java is, you know, quite common. We just want to create a small list or a small set. And different programming languages like Python have a syntactic sugar to create arrays or create dictionaries. Now, we're not getting this in, in Java. We're not having syntactic sugar for this. But there's an update to the API that provides convenient factories like list.off or set.off to create a sort of small uh, collections that we're interested in. So if you're using something like Guava, Guava has it. That's something that is now coming in Java 9 as well. So Richard, we've talked about problems with collections. We've talked about what's happening in Java 8 and Java 9. Let's look a little bit at what are possible improvements with collections. Big picture stuff. So if we think about what happens with collections, we can kind of think about uh, different categories or, or classifications of collections. So 
What most people use most of the time, at least in the Java ecosystem, is what we describe as unsynchronized mutable collections. So that's something like an array list or a hash map. You can update it. It changes that collection value right in front of you. And it's not thread safe uh, for uh, modification on different threads, as we, as we demonstrated earlier. Then there's a kind of mutable but concurrent thing. So things like concurrent hash map, which have thread safety to them, but are still mutating, changing the same underlying data structure. But there's a few other things we can think about with collections. Firstly is the delightful unmodifiable view. So just the collections API for years has ways of having unmodifiable views. So you have one mutable collection object, and you can pass around unmodifiable views around your application. But Increasingly, you kind of see people using immutable collections. So immutable collections can be persistent or non-persistent. What's, what's the distinction between those terms? Well, before we dive into this, let's just do a quick recap of um, what mutable means, because you know, it's sort of an abstract terminology. So popular friends, arrays, array list, tree set, basically updating the content of their collection, so we're mutating it. So it's really providing memory efficient operation. We've got access to the content, we're changing it directly. The downside with mutability is that you can introduce accidental updates. Maybe a reference to that collection is propagated in your code, someone is modifying it, which you're not expecting. Well, unmodifiable. Unmodifiable views help ameliorate this problem a little bit. So we can have, say, for example, our backing array list of Jedi's, which we've added loot to. And when we call, uh, plop and unwrap that in an unmodifiable list here, and we try and add Darth Vader into this list, we get an exception. We can't have the Sith adding themselves into our list of Jedi's. Okay? Whereas if we had just uh, taken the uh, original array list and we had access to that, we could still add Darth Vader into our list of Jedi's. So um, if they just understood about this one wrapper class, then a lot of the plot of Star Wars could be massively simplified. Um, but yeah, unmodifiable views reduce the scope for mutability and let you restrict that down. But we can do better than that, right? Yeah, so you know, unmodifiable provides a sort of a cheap view around an existing mutable collection. So that's quite cheap. The downside is it's still not preventing those accidental writes if we directly accessing the source. So. You know, what we really want to have, it's something like, not a dev star. Dev star is a bit like the unmodifiable list. It looks really protected from the outside, but there's one tiny little flow. What we want is <laughs> dev star version 2.0, right? It has no thermal exhaust port vulnerabilities. That's what immutable collections are. They're collections without a thermal exhaust port vulnerability. Precisely. So immutable collections provide no updates. So once you've got that collection, you can't change it. You can only read from it. And that has a few uh, benefits. If we know that we can't write to it, it means the underlying representation can be more optimized. So something like a tree or linked list could be represented as a, an array that has a continuous allocation of memory. It's very predictable what the next element is. It's just an offset. It can be easily prefetched, stored in a cache with fast access. The other benefit is the nodes that you typically have with collection, like the node for a linked list or a tree node, they can be coalesced together as a single value stored in the array. Another benefit is in the context of concurrency, no locking is required. We can't change the immutable collection. But even more exciting is that it satisfies something called covariant subtyping. So if you're familiar with generics, it means that if we've got a list of Jedi Master, an immutable list of Jedi Master, and an immutable list of junior Jedi's, they could all be used in the context of a list of Jedi's because we've got a subtyping property in a safe manner. So we call those immutable collection non-persistent. That means you've got a single version of it, you can't change it, you can't have an update, so they're non-persistent. If you want to change that collection, what you can do is provide a new version, a copy of this immutable collection, and we call this persistence. But so doesn't that mean that if we copy it, every time we want to add a single element, it's going to be really inefficient? That, that is true. So, you know, that's a sort of myth when we think about functional programming and immutability is that just to change a single value, we've got to copy the whole data structure and provide an updated version with one single element changed. And what we're going to look at at this talk is a couple of techniques 
that actually lets you share structure with the previous source. But let's say we want to add immutable collections in Java, right? in the Java API. How could we do this? So this is a hierarchy taken from the Eclipse collections, which just got rebranded from the Goldman Sachs collection. And what they do is they really split the hierarchy between mutable collection and immutable collections. The mutable list here is implementing the java.util.list, so you can use it in the context of a list. That's nice. We can retrofit nicely. The immutable list is something separate that implements a separate interface called list iterable, which only provides read-only operations. So that's the read-only view. Those two classes here, those two interfaces, are both implementing list iterable, meaning we're able to use an immutable list or a mutable list in the context of list iterable. So the key difference why these interfaces need to be split out a little bit is if you just think about what the add method would return. Now, in the case of a mutable list, you're adding an element to yourself. You don't need to. You could return a Boolean like the collections API does. You could return void or something like that. Um, you are changing yourself. You don't need to give a reference back to anything. Whereas with the immutable version, because you're returning a new list in itself, you need to return a different type. You need to return some kind of, in this case, immutable list of T. So immutable and persistent. So that's uh, an enhancement, if you will, to immutable and non-persistent. It means, hold on, we may wish to actually update that collection, what's available to us. Well, one technique is copying the whole thing, providing an updated value. Another technique which we see implemented in a functional kind of collection, functional languages, is called uh, sharing the structure with the underlying source, which means we don't have to do a full copy. So let's take a look at how this could work. So here's a basic example of a persistent list taken from 60 years ago or 70 years ago uh, from Lisp. Is anyone a fan of the parentheses in the room? We've got one person. <laughs> Just John. There's always Big round one. of applause for his bravery. <laughs> um, so yeah. The way this works is you know, we want to update this list. We've got a tail, and we're going to wrap up this tail with the new element. So we don't need to modify anything. We're just wrapping it up. And that provides you a new list. If you want to add a new element, again, we just wrap this new tail with the head, which is a new element, and so on. So in this way, we don't need to change um, the state of this collection. But you know, adding an element is one thing. What about updating a specific element inside the collection? So conceptually, what we're interested in doing here, let's say we've got a, you know, a list of uh, elements. Those are values. We'd like to update C. Richard, what could be an approach here for, for changing this collection? A naive approach is we could just copy everything as we go along and then put the new C in and then just copy everything after C as well. Just copy everything, call copy. a C a tool. That would work, right? Copy all the things. Another approach would be, hold on, let's create a copy of C. Obviously, I need to update B now to give it the new location of where this updated node is. So let's copy B again. But now I need to update A as well because I need to provide a new location for this new node for B. And we copy that as well. So by doing this, what we need to do is to copy all the elements leading to the one we need to change only. That provides you with the head, and we can connect that back to the remaining of the list. This technique is called path copying, which means we don't need to actually copy the whole list. So if you want to update things at the beginning of the list, it's really nice and cheap. If you want to update things at the end of the list, it's really nasty and expensive. And the same technique can be used for concatenating two persistent lists. Something that may be useful, for example, in the context of data parallelization, we have two intermediate results which we need to merge. We don't need to copy all of those elements. We need to copy the first elements and connect that back to the second list. This approach, even though it lets you uh, share the structure with the previous sorts, has a few downsides as well. We're connecting the nodes one by one, so it has poor locality. So again, if we think about prefetching, ideally we want to have one continuous memory region stored in the cache. Now we need to look up all those different elements that could be in random location in the memory. So you're doing a random walk around your computer's memory, not, not very fast or efficient. Not fast, not efficient, and very hard to split in the context of data prioritization. So let's see if we can improve on this a little bit. 
you know, let's say we want to update an element at the very end of that list. We've got to traverse the whole thing, copy it. But instead, maybe we can use a binary tree, you know, so we can have fewer access to reach the particular element we're interested in. So what I'd like to do here is to update this element here, a leaf node at the bottom right of this tree. What we can do is to just use, you know, two traversal, reach the element, provide an updated copy. We need to go back to the parent. That needs to be updated, so copy that as, uh, as well. Go back to the parent, copy that as well. We reach the root, and now we can connect all the other structure with the source of the tree. So again, we're sharing structure. We don't need to copy the whole chain. But Raul, is there a way that we can get some of the benefits of these persistent data structures in terms of improved safety, uh, the nice persistency properties that we saw, and try and get something a little bit closer to, say, an array where we have nice linear accesses, at least over the pointers, if not the, the objects themselves. So what I'm trying to do here would be so cool if we had a Jedi power and Sith power together, like totally win the war. So here's a, a technique available in, um, in things like Clojure and Scala. So let's think about this data structure is called a try. Some people pronounce it tree, but it's a bit confusing because you've got a tree, the binary tree. So this is going to be a try, right? Which is a bit like a tree where the branching factor is beyond two. So I could have, you know, many different branches here connecting up to, to the parent. And the other thing about this data structure is that the values are stored in leaf nodes. So at the very bottom of this try. The way you can access element is through a key. So for example, here I have the key AC because I'm interested in finding out all the words, all the, the words that start with the prefix AC. So I will navigate that structure, start with A, and then go to C, and then I'm left with all the words potentially that start with AC or the number of occurrences. So very useful data structure, for example, storing a dictionary and providing fast access to search words. Okay? But how do we get from this to a faster array? Well, one of the problems with uh, the binary tree approach is that we need to perform a depth first search, so we need really need to go really down uh, the nodes to find out the one we're interested in. So as a way to create a shallow try, what we need to do is to extend the number of children nodes that uh, each node could have. So let's say here we're going to represent that through a, um, an array with 32 elements. Each of those elements is connecting to another array, which is connecting to 32 elements, and then we reach the leaf nodes. By using this structure, with only 32 elements in an array and have five levels, so five access, we can store up to 30 million elements, so 32 to the power of five. So that's, uh, that's interesting. We can provide a better iteration. The other thing that this data structure provides is often called bitmapped vector try. So instead of using a string as a key, we have the index, the number that we're trying to access, and we have a bit representation which means we can use bit operation to find out where we need to navigate to. So the key intuition you've got here, Raul, is if you make those nodes fatter, then you need to chase down deeper. But if you make them fatter, doesn't that mean you need to allocate fatter nodes as well? Is there some kind of trade-off here? So that's exactly the trade-off. If we use a larger branching factor, it means the depth of search is shorter, because we only need to navigate through maybe like five levels here. But unfortunately, that means we probably need to do more copying because we've got 32 nodes at each time that we have to copy if we provide an update. Using a smaller branching factor means we'll have to navigate further along in the, in the hierarchy of this try, but we've got fewer elements to copy. So that's always a trade-off here. And 32 is a little bit the magic number that uh, Clojure and Scala have been using uh, for the um, implementation of the data, stru data structure, which provides the right trade-off in terms of iteration and updates. But Richard, let's talk a little bit about existing implementation of this data structure. So maybe you're not using Clojure or Scala. There's actually some uh, existing ports of those data structures over into the Java ecosystem. So you can still get the benefits of some of these features without having to change language, uh, which, given that very few people liked brackets in the room, uh, is possibly a good idea. So uh, there's Clojure DS, and there's the DEX library as well, which is the port of the Scala data structures. And there's also the existing P collections library, which doesn't do anything uh, quite so complicated as, as, as the bitmap vector try, but has been around for a while, and people use solidly in production for a number of years. It's worth 
mentioned as well, this is an area where you see constant improvements. The papers release every year on how to improve this kind of data structure. Um, but Richard, we thought about performance a little bit. What about the memory concern of those data structures? Yes, yeah, an interesting one. So, so one of the things you might immediately, or what, what I would have perhaps intuitively thought, is if you look at those bitmap vector tries, they're going to eat a lot of memory with those very, very fat nodes being allocated. But Raoul did a quick memory comparison here of, say, taking these uh, collections and adding a bunch of integers into them. Now, as you'd expect, the good old primitive interray is fantastically out ahead with 40 meg. Always worth remembering whenever you're talking about these things. If you can get them down to primitives, that's lovely. You will save a lot of memory and save a lot of pointer chasing. Integer array and array list of integer, it's 160 meg and 215 meg. But Raoul, isn't an array list of integer basically being backed by an integer array under the hood anyway? Why is it so much bigger here? Well, so what we've got going on here is that the primitive array, the integer array here, have a fixed size. So we know ahead of time that's going to be the size so we can allocate it and we're done. Something like an array list can grow dynamically. So it needs a strategy to be able to say, well, I'm full now, let me create some new space for you. And typically it allocates double its initial size once it reaches a sort of threshold. So this is why in this case here, the array list is fatter than something like the vector from Scala DS because the array list has a chunk of memory here that is not being used yet. So these guys allocate less greedily. Fascinating. So if you're interested in reproducing those results, there's a tool called the Java Object Layout, which you can uh, look at um, for this. But as I say, primitives give you a great win, both for speed and also for reduced memory consumption. And there's actually a number of APIs that give you primitive specialized collections today without having to do anything. So Java 8 introduced the streams API and obviously also introduced the int long and double specializations of those streams and primitive specialized functional interfaces to go along with them, which gives you a, a massive performance win. There's also a bunch of third party libraries that provide primitive specialized collections. So Agrona, which is a, basically a library for utility code that's kind of related to high performance computing or low latency trading systems, has primitive specialized, primitive keyed hash maps and things like int to int maps as well. Colobokke and Eclipse collections are two projects that go the whole hog and aim to be kind of replacement collections APIs or to, to a certain extent replacement collections APIs. And both of them have a bunch of generated code with primitive specialized APIs that can again cause significantly reduced memory consumption. So if we think about something like um, I want to store an int, which is four bytes, into a, a hash set. If you use a hash set, you're paying a huge cost because this int is boxed to an integer. So we'll go from four bytes to 16 bytes. This has set is backed by another map, so it's going to have a, a node that stores the key and a dummy value as well, an object. So you're basically spending a lot of memory just to store a single int. So that's where those primitive collections are quite useful. And hopefully, when Java episode 10 comes out, you'll have the ability to have primitive specialized generics. So an array list of int genuinely backed by an int array and get a lot of the wins without having to do all this code generation. So. As we said, immutability reduces the scope for bugs, but there's always this kind of trade-off between that kind of performance and, and, and correctness for some of these APIs. But there's also a lot of research work being done on improving the performance, and for a lot of people, it works out pretty well. So that's it for persistence and immutable collection. We're going to spin it up into a different topic, talking about hash map, something that has been uh, improving in Java 8. So hash map is a little bit like um, Yoda. Map hash, hash we, we want. want. So when you never you need to look up a little bit of wisdom, you know, look up some wisdom from Yoda, that's what a hash map is useful. You look up a key and you get a value back. But how a hash map implemented? So let's cover a little bit of basics here before we look at some more advanced um, details here. So map is backed up by, by an array and we get a, a key hand solo here and we would like to give it a value and being able to store that in the map. So we need to associate this key to an index within that array. So typically, we've got a hash code mechanism that generates hash code, and that's how you can figure out what's the index in that underlying array. Okay. So here, our hand solo object happened to have a hash of 72,309. But you know, let's say Han Solo's friend Chewbacca comes in the game and has exactly the same hash and it's stored 
at the same location as Han Solo. How they share a spaceship, they might share a hash code. That might happen. Precisely. So how do we deal with this scenario? We've got a collision here. So when we need to look up the key for Han Solo, how do we fetch its associated value? That's the collision problem. There's different techniques to solve this problem. You know, one is maybe a better hash code uh, mechanism. There's different techniques for that. What we're going to cover is two ways of looking up collisions. One is called chaining. So that's a strategy where you've got a different data structure to represent the bucket. And this data structure lets you look up the keys. The other one is called probing, which means the bucket is a continuous array. And we're going to have a probing sequence to figure out what's the right value associated to that key. But you often find that, as a lot of terminology, multiple people give it different names. So for example, we have an alias here for Emperor, for Palpatine, and for Darth Sidious as his, as his Sith name. Uh, Darth Sidious, clearly trying to make him look evil. But if you look at this picture, he looks pretty evil to begin with, right? This is kind of unnecessary naming. And you know, just, for, just to add more confusion to the situation, our hash maps have different aliases and namings as well. So you might find that chaining is called closed addressing, and probing is called open addressing. Now, there's an alternative naming here called open hashing and closed hashing. And just to make things really confusing, these names are the other way around. So if you do look up things or follow up with the talk afterwards, just be aware of that, of that naming difference. If you're looking for a responsible person, for this, it's obviously the academics. Evil academics always have confusing names for everything. Yeah. So in terms of chaining, we, that's what we're going to focus on. There's two potential strategies that could be used here to look up the colliding uh, keys. One is a linked list based approach. So we just iterate through that linked list until we find the uh, right key. The other one is to use a tree based approach, which lets us navigate those elements provided they're comparable, then we can get a win. So traditionally, uh, in Java, the hash map was implemented using, well, it's still implemented using a chaining mechanism, but using a linked list approach. So we get a collision, we trade through that linked list until we find the appropriate key. Now, if we've got a lot of collisions, that means we get an ON complexity. We need to iterate through the whole thing until we potentially find the right key that we're interested in. And that kind of sucks, because it means when you get a lot of collisions, your hash map backs off, as you say, to being order and complexity. In Java 8, the underlying algorithm has changed a little bit. So it still starts off with a linked list to store these values. But then after a while, it starts to flip to a tree. So the tree of five threshold is eight elements, but it'll only get changed over to a tree when they do a complete resize of the map. Um, it doesn't start off using tree nodes right from the beginning, because tree nodes eat up a lot more memory. Um, and what this means is when you have heavy collision cases, you end up with going order log n rather than order n. So for this to actually work efficiently, the keys that you're using for your hash map needs to be comparable. So if you've got things that are inherently comparable but don't necessarily implement the interface, then they are, it's good to have them implement that interface. And just to make it clear what's going on here, we have a little visualization, which you might be able to see on the left-hand side of the screen. So these black guys are all empty buckets with nothing in. And we've jury rigged all the keys so they return the same hash code. Um, what this code is doing every time I press Enter is adding a new element into the hash map. And then it's using a bit of reflection to spy on what's actually going on inside. So you can see we've got you know, four, five, six, seven, and they keep on uh, link listing. Uh, we hit 8, which is the threshold, but it doesn't get changed until we get a full resize. And now we start resizing the data structure. So uh, if we see what's happened here, by adding a few more data elements, we've ended up replacing that bucket that was a linked list with a, tree base, a binary tree-based data structure that, again, improves the efficiency in this heavy hash code collision stuff. So it does work, which is always nice to know. But Richard, looks like we've got two approaches here, linked list and um, the tree-based approach and different mechanism for looking up the elements. You know, we need, a, we need a winner. Which one is the best? Why have we got a hybrid version here? Which ha and also, what about probing versus chaining as well? Well, what I've been doing recently is have, spending a bit of time doing some benchmarking work, looking at some of the different uh, 
uh, hash map implementations and seeing what works well for different situations. And benchmarking in general is the idea about understanding what's really going on or understanding these performance trade-offs. Um, what you see if you Google for like Java hash map benchmark is what I call a jar jar benchmark. So something like a map with an element of size one you just call get, you never test the case where it fails, you never go through any rigorous benchmarking strategy, and people declaring their custom hash map implementation is three times faster than Java. This benchmark was as useless as Jar Jar Binks. Which is why it's moves. called a Jar Jar benchmark. Um, but there's a bunch of other factors that you might want to think about, such as, for example, how heavily loaded is your hash map implementation? Uh, some benchmarks try and just linearly access keys, so they look at you know things like one, two, three, four, five, six, and all on their benchmark, and they can get surprisingly predictable access patterns that are unrealistic for a real-world application. What if your get method fails? For some of these hash map implementations, I noted that the failure case is about twice as slow as the successful case. Uh, what, how about your collision rates? What about if your keys are comparable or incomparable? Makes a big difference for the Java util hash map and lots of other things. But I'll just kind of go through a couple of the more interesting findings I had. So firstly, I investigated does this comparable uh, optimization work effectively? Um, and I did that by checking the difference between things being keys being comparable or incomparable. And so this is a benchmark that has very high collision rate and has various different sizes of benchmarks. Now, as you'd imagine, on a very small hash map, it won't have properly resized uh, or triified the elements. So for a very small hash map, it makes no difference. But as it scales up, you find it rapidly becomes much, much faster. So again, that does support the conclusion that if it is comparable and you wanted to use it as a key in a hash map, then you know, your worst case is going to be much improved by making that key implement comparable. So that's a, a nice big win. So what we mean by the collision here is the ratio of the number of elements in the hash map and the number of buckets. Because some of those elements will be in the buckets, hence a higher collision rate. And as you'd expect, if you drop the collision rate and you have very few collisions, it doesn't really make so much difference whatsoever. But it's still a good idea to be doing in case you do end up with collisions. Another thing that people often debate is the idea of, is probing or shading faster? It, it seems like almost it's kind of become like a Vi versus Emacs debate, where everyone's like religious on their own side or, or what have you. Um, probing hash maps do usually end up having lower memory consumption, because they don't have to support these linked list or tree-based backing stores. Um, what I noted was when you had smaller hash maps and hash maps with fewer collisions, you didn't get these long cluster chains of things where you try and probe and it fails and collides and collides and collides and collides. So they end up being quite significantly faster in some cases. However, if you have large hash maps, and especially hash maps that have higher collision rates, probing ends up scaling very poorly. And that's one of the key reasons why the Java util hash map is still chaining based, because in that kind of uh, worst case scenario, it still does very well. So, so there's no kind of clear cut winner here. The JDK implementation tries to minimize the worst case, whereas some of the third party implementations go for a really good best case, but you can have quite nasty trade offs if you have poor hash distributions. Um, one thing that's worth noting that I think very few people know is identity hash map is actually a probing based hash map that has very, very low memory consumption. And because it relies on this system the identity hash code method, which is uh, very evenly distributed and very randomized, it's quite fast. One of the most common types of keys are keys that don't override equals and hash code and just inherit the ones from Java Lang object, for which identity hash map is totally safe to use. So it is also a, without even bringing in a third party library, it's quite an interesting one to have a look at. If you do want to have a look at third party libraries bringing in probing hash maps, which might be faster in some use cases, then you know, Colobarque and Eclipse Collections both have quite good ones. And the final note I will say on that is that some of these things have fast in their name, but aren't necessarily that fast. And you do actually want to check whether they do work well before you use them. So another thing interesting with the probing approach is to keep in mind, since it's backed up by a continuous array, as we delete elements, we might be left with holes within this continuous array here that we still have to navigate through. So what certain data structure does, and that's something recently Eclipse Collection is, they start off with one probing mechanism, a linear one, at some point are able to switch to a different strategy, something like a quadratic 
probing or a double hashing mechanism. So those sort of techniques have become more and more complex, and we see this hybrid approach being used as well with um, open addressing. Cool. Fantastic. So another thing we noted when we're kind of just looking at, at different collection things was things like interface and implementation popularity. So these numbers are based upon a source code analysis of the Debian, of the Java packages in Debian. And uh, what you might see is a couple of places where people are weirdly using kind of old deprecated interfaces a lot. So Q isn't deprecated as such, but has been kind of superseded for many use cases in a better way by the double ended Q or DEC interface. And surprisingly, people don't really use DEC very much. So we also have a similar situation with sorted set and navigable map, sorted set and sort, uh, sorted set and navigable set, and sorted map and navigable map, where the sorted variants have been superseded by a more modern interface that has additional functionality that might be useful for you. And yet, people rarely use them. So something you can just, without taking in anything, is updating to the more modern interfaces, and you get more features just out of the box. And again, as I mentioned, identity hash map is a perfectly very, very fast, very, very memory efficient hash map that works for a lot of use cases that people use a regular hash map for, but is incredibly, incredibly unpopular. About 60 times less popular in this case. So another thing to think about using. Evolution is kind of an interesting thing. And even though data structures is one of those very, very old school, very, very fundamental topics, there's still a lot of evolution and progress that's been made over even the last 10 and 20 years. So, you know, the conclusion for, for this talk would be we really see two themes. One, which is about providing additional safety, and that's wi what we have with immutable collection. The other theme is about providing more efficiency, more performance. And typically, we see that we still have a trade off. We don't get the best of the both worlds is either one or the other one, but more and more work is being put in those two, two um, themes. And we see the APIs being updated to provide additional safety, and we see new techniques to provide us with more performant collections as well. So um, that's it for us. Um, before we take uh, the questions, we've got a couple of qu minutes for questions. Um, here's a, a plug slide. So if you're interested in taking some Java courses online, uh, Richard is a pluralsight author, um, so you can check that out. Uh, I run a startup called Cambridge Coding Academy, where we give courses on data science, and we've got machine learning boot camps, so check that out online. But between us, we've written two books on Java 8. So Richard wrote the one on Java 8 Lambdas, the O'Reilly one, and I wrote the one on Java 8 in action with uh, Mario here in the, in the room. And we provide training courses in Java 8, graduate training, uh, covering testing, software design, generics, yeah. and collections. So if you're interested in that, come and talk to us after. Come and talk to us. Great. So um, thanks for listening. Thank you. So we've got time for a couple of quick questions. Does anyone have any questions? So uh, the question is, it's a shame that we don't have some sort of easy syntax to work with map. Yes. So in Java 9, there is convenient factories to create immutable maps as well. Uh, it's just that it's not immut immutable maps is not a public API, but you're able to have a convenient ways of creating small maps using factory method in Java 9. Cool. Any other questions? So we're going to give a, um, a session at 1.45 till 2.15 in the upper area where we're just sitting down and chatting and taking questions. So if you've got any questions, you can join us there. We'd love to see you guys. Or if you want to talk about any questions, Java, anything. Thank you very much. <laughs>